Hello, I'm Mally Schatzfeld, Managing Editor of Endodontic Practice US, a Medmark publication. Welcome to a live presentation and question and answer with Dr. Martin Trope. In our webinar today, he will be exploring the limitations of retreating endodontic cases with conventional round files and will introduce a new protocol for retreating cases with the adaptive XP3D shaper and finisher instruments. Before we get started, I would like to invite viewers to use the question box in your control panel to ask any questions, and your questions will be answered at the end of the session. Also, associated with this presentation is a free CE quiz. At the end of the webinar, we will email all attendees instructions on how to access the CE quiz. The CE learning objectives are recognizing the limitations of using conventional round files for endodontic treatment, realizing the benefits of utilizing adaptive instrumentation that reaches areas of the canal that are not able to be reached by round SS and NITI files, identifying the proper technique for retreating cases with the XP3D shaper and XP3D finisher instruments. I'm pleased to introduce our guest for today. Dr. Martin Trope was born in Johannesburg, South Africa, where he received his BDS degree in dentistry in 1976. From 1976 to 1980, he practiced general dentistry and endodontics. In 1980, he moved to Philadelphia to specialize in endodontics at the University of Pennsylvania. After graduating as an endodontist, he continued at the University of Pennsylvania as a faculty member until 1989, when he became chair of endodontology at Temple University School of Dentistry. In 1993, he accepted the J.B. Friedland professorship in the Department of Endodontics at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill School of Dentistry. Named in honor of one of the founding fathers of endodontics, the Friedland Professorship recognizes significant contributions to the specialty. In 2014, he was awarded the Jens Andreasen Lifetime Achievement Award by the International Association of Dental Traumatology. Dr. Trope is a clinical professor, Department of Endodontics, School of Dental Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, and he's also in private practice in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Dr. Trope, we turn the webinar over to you to learn more about your topic for today. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and to uh, present uh, this subject uh, to the audience. Uh, and uh, basically, obviously, we would all like to uh, have successful treat, uh, treatments in when we do uh, endodontics. And uh, we have to first define what is considered uh, success in endodontics. And this has actually changed uh, in the uh, implant era where functionality has become a definition of success. So if we define uh, success in endodontics today, we look at two aspects. The first is biologic success, and this is what we have done traditionally from the beginning of uh, the specialty, and that is uh, no detectable disease. So that would classically be a patient with no symptoms obviously but then we'd look at the radiograph and we do not want to see any sign of periradicular inflammation lucencies primarily at the apex or around accessory uh, canals etc recently we have acknowledged that survivability functionality is extremely important we used to take it for granted that we would like to save the natural tooth, but in the implant era, uh, uh, we went through a period where some of our colleagues uh, uh, thought that it would be more beneficial to take out a tooth and to replace it by an implant. So now we've changed in endodontics a little bit, and we also define functionality, survivability as a very important outcome. So the tooth should survive and function without symptoms for the life of the patient. Now, obviously we want both of these things. Uh, uh, we want no detectable disease and we want functionality, survivability for the life of the patient. Now, in terms of biologic requirements for success, these never change. And they're very simple, not that easy to achieve, but they're pretty simple. And that is basically in the absence of microbes, whether you're doing a primary endodontic treatment or a retreatment, if you as the practitioner can ensure that the microbial count 
in the root canal system is lowered to a, a very, very low level, and then your root filling and top filling maintains that low level, we will have biologic success. How to achieve that is the clinical requirements for success, and this is changing all the time. And like everything else in our life, uh, technology is changing at a very, rare, very rapid rate, and we have to keep up with this technology and very importantly, evaluate new technologies, not only as to whether they make our life more simple as dentists or endodontists, but also are they going to be able to achieve the biological aim of uh, microbial control more effectively than uh, uh, previous technologies? Otherwise, basically, they're not worth adapting. So I'm going to present to you today adaptive instruments, particularly for retreatment. And I'm going to claim that this is a giant step forward and a new era in uh, achieving biologic success for uh, both primary treatment, I'll, I'll cover very, very briefly, but particularly for uh, retreatment. So when we talk about retreatment, we're really talking about post-treatment endodontic disease. Remember, when we do treatment, we're trying to eliminate or prevent the disease but we have been unsuccessful in these cases, or you are presented with a case that has been unsuccessful. And we sort of define the post-endodontic disease into a number of categories. Uh, the first is persistent disease, that is uh, we treat a case with uh, a lesion, and uh, we come back at a follow-up of uh, one year, three years, five years, et cetera, and that lesion is still present. So obviously what we have done has not lowered the microbial count to the extent that uh, this should heal. <coughs> There's also recurrent disease where you have an initial healing, you've lowered the bacterial count and the, you get an initial reaction in the apical periodontitis. But over time, the microbes are able to regrow, reestablish themselves in open spaces, etc and at the follow-up, at a later stage, you will have uh, a lesion again. So maybe the one-year lesion looks pretty good, it's not completely healed, but it's getting better. At the five-year or four-year follow-up, the lesion has uh, re-established uh, itself, if you will. And then the most uh, disturbing is the emerged lesion, because uh, here, there was no lesion to start, and that's usually a vital tooth because vital teeth are free of microbes. So uh, uh, we don't expect apical periodontitis with vital teeth. And then after the treatment at the follow-up, we uh, see that a lesion has developed. And this is usually a sign of a uh, non-sterile technique where microbes have been introduced into the root canal system during the treatment or a poor uh, root canal filling or uh, uh, top filling, which allows coronal leakage and microbes to establish themselves in the uh, root canal space. Now, there are a number of different reasons a tooth may fail or a root canal treatment may fail, but 90 to 95% of the cases, it's due to microbes in the uh, canal space. We do have extra radicular infections. These, this is rare, and uh, about 5% of the cases, you could have uh, microbes establish themselves in the periradicular tissues, or actually as a plaque, a biofilm on the external surface of the root canal. And uh, then there is a theory uh, that a true cyst may not be able to heal. And these other five to 10% of cases will not heal even with primary treatment or with retreatment. Now, I'm going to concentrate exclusively on intraradicular infection in this lecture, and the reason is very simple. We have no way to tell pre-treatment whether these other 5 to 10% of cases are present. So we always go into a case thinking that we can treat it successfully with intraradicular disinfection, and then if 
that fails, then we would uh, uh, consider uh, apical surgery or extraction. So, intraradicular infection. Now, in a primary case, most of the bacteria are in the main canal in the planktonic form. In a root canal that has been treated before, a failed root canal, those planktonic bacteria in the main canal are not present. So our biggest problem is the canal walls, particularly in the apical third of the canal. And what we find is that those canal walls are generally covered by a biofilm. And that biofilm is no different from periodontal plaque. And that periodontal plaque uh, is uh, uh, the same as periodontal disease plaque. We need to scrape it and physically disrupt it in order to then wash it out. It's a thousand more times more difficult to remove than the planktonic bacteria, which are present in the uh, uh, primary endo, but not really present for a retreatment. Now, this is a huge problem because canals are not round, but up to this point, all the instruments we've used, whether stainless steel or nickel titanium, have a round diameter which fill up the ma main canal space. Therefore, it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, in many cases, to scrape this biofilm. The reason for that is the canals are not round. So you've got a round technology which is trying to clean a non-round canal. And the result is either you underclean it, which is the main uh, uh, problem, or if you try to clean everything in the non-round canal, then you are so aggressive in removing dentin that the survivability or functionality is uh, jeopardized. So these old technologies are a major problem. So this is a particular problem when the root canal has already been filled and now we've got an additional obstacle, if you will. We've got to take out the old root canal filling. The root canal has probably failed for a very good reason. So the root canal filling is not in the place it should be. We've got to reestablish the correct anatomy and clean these biofilm uh, in the non-round aspects of uh, the canal. The second uh, additional uh, challenge in a retreatment is that when you have an established uh, inflammation, particularly at the apex, some of the cementum is removed. And when the cementum is removed from the external surface of the root, microbes can move all the way through the dentinal tubules to that external surface. Generally, microbes don't move very far into the dentinal tubules as long as cementum covers the root surface. So if I've got a normal situation, you would have no more than 100 to uh, maybe 300 microns. So it's a, a, a point, uh, one, uh, 10% or 30% of a millimeter of microbes into the root canal uh, dentin. So if you scrape that dentin, it's very easy to remove those microbes. But in the apex with an established lesion where the cementum has been resorbed away in certain spots, now we have a tremendous uh, uh, challenge in getting to those very, very deep microbes. And then of course, you've got lateral canals, isthmuses between the main canals, and for these, we rely on agitation of an active irrigant to try to get to those areas and kill those uh, microbes. Now, from a biological perspective, the best way to treat a failed root canal is a retreatment. And the reason is very simple. If you do a retreatment, you are cleaning the entire canal and hopefully disinfecting the entire canal, then sealing it with a very good seal. And uh, you have started with low numbers of bacteria and sealed them very, very well. So you should get a very good result. The alternative apical surgery is removing the apical uh, few millimeters, which is uh, uh, good because that's where the complex anatomy is. 
and then putting a plug of about three millimeters into the, the apical part of the canal. So you're not really cleaning the entire canal. So basically what you're doing is you're sealing the exit of the uh, canal and uh, uh, hoping that the microbes in the main canal are not going to communicate with the periradicular tissues, therefore disease will not be maintained or developed. Okay, this requires at least three to four millimeters of a good apical plug with a bioceramic material, which is quite technically difficult because with the apicoectomy, we have to get access to the apex, we have to get uh, access to the long axis of the root, and this is not as easy as it sounds or looks. Uh, with micro surgical techniques, it's become much easier, and uh, we have some super. Uh, uh, surgeons, microsurgeons in endodontics, but for the average person, this is not that easy to do. So a retreatment, if possible, and if the retreatment will not affect the survivability, the functionality of the tooth, should always be attempted. And I'm going to look a little bit deeper into this. So if we look at uh, the studies, and here is a, a systematic review from Europe, and you see that overall retreatment success is 77% success, and we're talking here biologic success, not survivability, biologic success. But the success rate is a little bit troubling when you go a little bit deeper into that, because if there's no apical periodontitis, now very few of the cases we retreat don't have lesions, okay? You have some cases where you've got to do it for restorative reasons and things like that. But generally speaking, we do a retreatment when there are symptoms or presence of apical periodontitis. And if you look when there's no lesion, the, 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 the minority of cases we do, the success rate is excellent. But when there is a lesion, the success rate is only 65.7% of the uh, uh, percent success. Now, this is the vast majority of the cases we do. And this has been used by the implant uh, uh, field to say, look, uh, uh, you know, you get 65% success from um, a retreatment. We get 95% success in an implant. You should do an implant. I just want to remind you that this is biologic success and the implant success rate is survivability. The survivability, even in these cases, is equivalent to implants, 95% uh, over a, fair, a short period of time, uh, uh, which is maintained in root canal, but not maintained in implants. And uh, 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 biologic success is a different animal completely. Now let's look when we should do a retreatment and when we shouldn't do a retreatment. So number one, you do a retreatment when even though there's no apical periodontitis, we need to redo the crown of the tooth. And if that's the case, we worry that we're going to introduce microbes, we're gonna disrupt any seal that we have. So we do a preventative root canal here, and then we restore the tooth. And as I've said before, if you have no apical periodontitis, the prognosis is excellent. Now, when there's symptoms or there is a definite lesion and you have poor root canal, or you have a poor root canal and there's no symptoms, then we would do a retreatment before we restore these teeth. Now, this is probably the most important slide so far. And this is from Gorni and Gagliani, and they analyzed the failures. And what they found was, if the root canal morphology was respected in the apical third, Okay, then with no apical periodontitis, there was 91.6% success. Even if there was apical periodontitis, the success rate was pretty high, almost 84%. So if you're looking at a case and you want to decide if you should do a retreatment or not, if you are confident that you can get to the apical third of the root canal and clean it and fill it as required, you get a, an extremely high success rate and you should do the retreatment. If on the other hand, like you see in this case, there's ledging, 
And I look at this case and I say, you know, I don't think I'm going to get, be able to get back into that main canal. I don't think I'm going to be able to clean the apical third of this canal. And um, I'm very worried about this case. Then if you look at the success rate, if there's no apical periodontitis, we should still do it. 85% almost success. But if there is apical periodontitis, and remember these are the majority of the cases, we only get a 40% success rate. So previously we, should, we used to do re, uh, retreatment uh, uh, you know, without really thinking, then reevaluate after a year or two, and then maybe go to apical surgery. Today we believe that if you are pretty confident with your skill set that you are not going to be able to get to the apical third, and you're not going to be able to clean the apical third, then we should go straight to apical surgery. Okay? Because this 40% is what brings down the success rate overall, and uh, it's not worth treating. So basically, if the root canal apical morphology can be respected, we can efficiently clean, then we do non-surgical. If we can't, we do surgical retreatment. Uh, in addition, if the retreatment is going to affect the survivability and restorability of this tooth, then we may do apical surgery. In this case, it was evaluated that by taking this post and crown off, finding the missed canal, etc., the restorability of this tooth would be jeopardized. So this was treated with an apical approach. In this case, there is fixed unit bridge so they felt that they could uh, uh, do a retreatment through this uh, uh, bridge and post in all, uh, and and the uh, restoration would uh, not be jeopardized found the extra canal treated the extra canal and success was achieved now finding a missed canal is very very important with CBCTs, we now know that um, uh, we can look at these cases in three dimensions, and we know that in apical lesions with missed canals, they were present in 82.8% of the cases. So if you had a missed canal, you had almost 83% chance that you're going to have a failure. So finding all the canals is absolutely essential. Uh, teeth with a missed canal were 4.38 times more likely to develop a lesion. So it's extremely important to find the canals. And of course, a microscope and three-dimensional radiographs like a CBCT is absolutely uh, priceless, if you will, in uh, retreatment diagnosis and also choosing whether to do a retreatment or to go to a surgical approach. So we go back to this case, the uh, uh, canal was found, an accessory canal was, uh, uh, was um, uh, filled, and after six months, everything healed up very, very well. So how do we do this? How do we clean the areas by logic success, and at the same time, not destroy the tooth? functional success. And this has been a major, major challenge with the technologies that we've had before, because if you have a round file that fills the entire canal, number one, as I mentioned before, that round file will not be able to scrape the biofilm in the non-round areas of the canal. At the same time, when you take out the old root canal filling, a round file pushes debris, pushes microbes, pushes old root canal filling into these irregular areas, making it even more difficult to clean them and making it difficult for the irrigant to get to them. So we have to instrument very, very aggressively in these cases. And if you do instrument very aggressively, then you're affecting the functional success because you are removing much too much tooth structure. So this is where these 3D instruments come in, and this is where 
uh, uh, they have a tremendous advantage of being able to clean the canal, remove the old filling without pushing debris into the irregularities because they are, uh, uh, for all intents and purposes, hollow. And then we've got other instruments, a second instrument that will get into all these deep areas, scrape the biofilm and uh, uh, do uh, what is necessary. So these instruments are based on uh, moving from a martensite form of nickel titanium. And uh, this is at room temperature. And the martensite form is when the instrument is malleable and movable. And when they get to body temperature, they will stiffen into a preformed shape. And this is just a small demonstration of how this works. Here is a, a paper clip made of nickel titanium. It's at room temperature, so it can be uh, moved and manipulated into any uh, shape that uh, is required or uh, wanted. And then as soon as it gets to body temperature, demonstrated here by warm water, then you see it immediately goes back to the austenite phase, which is the predetermined shape of this instrument or this paperclip in this case. So when we talk about our instruments, when they are uh, outside the mouth at body temperature, they can be manipulated, uh, uh, et cetera. But when they get into the root canal, they go to body temperature and want to go to a stiffer phase, which is uh, more efficient in cutting dentin, moving old filling, et cetera. So there are two instruments. There's a shaper, and a finisher. So let's first go to the shaper. So the shaper, as you see, is uh, an instrument like you're not used to seeing a root canal uh, file. And uh, basically what it is, is a very, very thin wire. It's a 30 at the tip, and it has a special tip, which I'll describe in a minute. And it's in a serpentine shape. Okay. And the metal is an O1 taper. So it's almost parallel, making it very, very flexible and very compressible, expandable. These loops get uh, progressively larger. So if you spin this instrument in air, uh, you will get a hollow shape, basically. And coming out of the packet it, in Martin's site, it's probably close to an O4 taper when you're spinning it. Okay, now when it goes to austenite in the body, if it is not stressed, in other words, in a large canal, it will stiffen and expand to an O8 taper. But on the other hand, if this is a small canal, which is maybe naturally an O2 taper, it is so flexible it will contract down to that O2 taper. And then only over time will it be able to expand to a maximum of an O4 taper. Just uh, this is more important in uh, primary endodontics, but it has a special tip where the first part of the tip is non cutting and very sharp. So that follows the glide path. In retreatment, this second part of the tip is the most important because it's rather aggressive. It's a six cutting edge tip, and it's at an angle which goes from a 15 to a 30. And it's, this is all in 0.3 millimeters. So you've basically got a carbide burr that will cut dentin getting from a 15 to a 30 within 0.3 millimeters. And the rest of the instrument is, as I described, the 3001. Now, the biggest advantage especially in primary end, is its adaptability. Okay, so because this instrument is so flexible and so compressible, etc., it is going to move in a serpentine manner. So it can go, say, 0.3 in one direction and 1.5 in another direction, depending on the path of least resistance. So this is not going to make a round shape. This is going to adapt 
to the shape of the canal based on moving in the path of least resistance. So if there is resistance in the narrower part of the canal, it will move in the larger part of the canal. So you see a large canal here and it's moving in a snake-like fashion, serpentine-like fashion. And by moving it up and down, you see that it has the ability to clean the non-round areas of the canal, whereas a big round file would stay centered, make an artificial round shape and push debris into all the non-round areas. Now, what about the finisher? Now, the finisher is actually the key instrument because the shaper will be very conservative. It will make at least a size 30 and it will touch the walls. But the finisher is the instrument that has an unlimited capacity to get into all the irregularities and it has the ability to clean without changing the shape of the dentin. So if we look at this uh, finisher and the standard finisher, it is a 25 without any taper at all. And in austenite, this is the shape that it will get to. So this is the shape it wants to get to in the root canal. And this is equivalent to a periodontal scalar or a sickle shape. So this is the instrument that is going to get into the deep areas, get rid of the old cement, get rid of the old gutta percha, get rid of the biofilm, et cetera, et cetera. And the unique thing about this instrument is because it's so flexible, it can do the scraping like a periodontal scale on the outside of the root, but it is not strong enough or stiff enough to change the shape of the canal. So this instrument's able to clean without changing the, or without removing unnecessary dentin, thus maintaining the survivability of this uh, route. So here's what it looks like spinning. Now, if the canal squeezes the bulb, the tip can expand up to six millimeters, almost an unlimited space. If the tip is compressed and the bulb can expand, so by moving it up and down inside the canal, this instrument's going to contract, expand, contract, expand, and reach all these previously unreachable areas. So uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. So uh, this is uh, just to uh, engrave in your minds, if you will, what this is doing. Let's think of this pot, which was very dirty. Uh, initially, we clean out all the debris and everything like that. That's the shaper. And now the finisher gets to the real deep, sticky biofilm, sealer, gutta percha, etc. Uh, and here we have a pot with sticky stuff in it. I don't know what it is. Uh, this is a Brazilian uh, uh, colleague of mine, so I don't know what he was. Uh, cooking, but here you have your normal irrigation, which is not going to get rid of the biofilm and uh, difficult uh, uh, small areas to do. So your finisher is equivalent to this sponge, and that's going to scrape away all the very difficult areas to give you a absolutely clean surface. So here is, this is, again, is not retreatment, but this shows how this is working because you see how it expands in one dimension and stays narrow in another dimension. Uh, if you were using a round file, you would have to instrument this entire thing here, weakening the root in the smaller dimension tremendously. But this instrument is so adaptive that it will move in the long axis or the wider part of the canal while being squeezed into the narrow part of the canal and not changing the original shape of the canal. So now we go to retreatment. And now it's a little bit different because the shaper is now used like a corkscrew. So the shaper is just to remove the old filling, okay? And this is one of the problems we have with retreatment is the canal is already filled 
and already probably misdirected a little bit and your taper is already predetermined etc cetera, etc cetera. so the shaper is able to wrap itself around the old filling even carriers in old fillings and as long as the shaper is going in clockwise whatever is in there will come out counterclockwise okay now the finisher is a little bit different from what i described it's a finisher r and the finisher r has a core diameter of 30 and not 25. the basic difference there is it's a little bit stiffer and a little bit more aggressive because that's needed because now unlike a, a, a primary endo we're not only scraping away biofilm but we have to scrape away old root canal filling old sealer uh etc cetera, etc cetera, and that is um, uh, much more difficult to do so we need something that is a little bit stiffer than the traditional uh, xp 3d finisher so when we talk about the uh, uh, shaper you've got this serpentine shape as i said and we're going to use this as a corkscrew so if it's going in whatever's coming out so i'm not i'm going to describe in detail how to use it but what you see here is a starting point that's been made we are going to use this uh, uh, shaper and actually i don't use a new shaper i use a sterilized shaper from a primary endo because the uh, uh, serpentine shape is not as important in a retreatment as it is in a primary treatment and we're going to use these instruments at two and a half to three thousand rpm okay you don't have to worry about cyclic fatigue fracture uh, we really need this instrument to move through the uh, uh, gutter percha and not get the tip to lock and we do that by increasing the speed so two and a half to three two to three thousand uh, rpm i tend to go on the fast side rather than on the slower side so this is just be a demonstration you see you get the starting point and as long as the instrument is going in the gutter percha will come out and it wraps around the gutter percha because there's space for the file and the gutter percha and it will come out in a matter of seconds so this is going to save a tremendous amount of time in getting out the old filling and uh, generally i can tell whether this is a lateral condensation re uh, a primary treatment because these strings of uh, uh, gutta percha come out or a vertical condensation the whole uh, uh, bulk of the gutta percha comes out but if you get the instrument going in gutta percha or carrier or whatever is in there will come out so this will save a tremendous amount of time and from a biological point of view the main advantage is unlike a round file it's not pushing things sideways it's wrapping and bringing everything out so it's making it much easier for the second instrument the finisher to do a effective deep cleaning uh, than if everything is burnished if you will into the irregularities of the canal the finisher r as i've said before is the key instrument so the finisher r is the deep deep cleaner and this is going to be very advantageous because this instrument moves not only to the outer wall but to the inner wall itself if we were to use ultrasonics then the ultrasonic would tend not to work very well in the apical third but at the same time also tend to favor the outer wall when we look at a retreatment there's got a purchase sealer gunk on the inner wall as well and uh, this finisher is going to uh, be effective on the inner wall and you can see here past the curvature that the instrument the bulb is contracted of course and wherever there's space outer wall and inner wall this is going to move and scrape that wall of gutta percha sealer and biofilm without changing or removing dentin therefore maintaining the strength of this roof 
So we have cases where the uh, practitioner does everything they used to do, and then you use the finisher and you see how gutta percha just starts coming out of this canal that many practitioners don't even know is there. And this is cleaned and cleaned and cleaned until it is squeaky clean, like the pot that I showed you. So let's get into the details. How do we do this? Number one, as I said before, you need a starting point. We want a starting point in the gutta percha because you don't want to make the uh, taper any bigger than it is because as you increase the taper, so you weaken the tooth. So you could use a small gate skirt and burr, an orifice opener, or even a very thin ultrasonic tip inside the gutta percha for one, two, three, however many millimeters of gutta percha can easily be penetrated with this step one. Some people do, and I do add a solvent, uh, some don't, but generally it would also depend how well the root canal is done initially. If it's not done very well, you don't need a solvent. If it looks very dense in the coronal aspect, I put one drop of solvent in there, and then we're going to use the instrument. Uh, the general recommendation for retreatment is 2000 to 3000 RPM. As I said before, my preference is 3000 RPM. So you sort of start the instrument outside the uh, root canal, peck, 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 and it sort of catches, let it go. And if it's going in, something must be coming out. After you've got the bulk of the gutta percha out, then we would use a 1502 stainless steel file just to reestablish our working length. And remember, the apical third is the critical part. So we want to get a glide path in the apical third. Sometimes the old gutta percha creates the glide path for you. Sometimes you have to recreate the glide path. And remember, why we need a 1502 is, as I said, the booster tip starts working, if you will, at the 15, and it's going to get to the 30 uh, due to this booster tip. So we want to create a 15 glide path, and then we do 15 strokes with the shaper. So the 15 strokes with the shaper, that will get rid of the bulk of the uh, 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 previous root canal filling and allow space for the finisher to work without the tip of the finisher getting locked in the canal. So once you've done that, irrigate very, very well. Uh, we irrigate after the first step, and then we irrigate after the second step, and then the key deep cleaning. And this is the finisher R at uh, generally at 1000 RPM. You can go at the same speed as the shaper, but now we've got the bulk of the material out. So I generally go at a lower speed, 1,000 RPM, and we use 30 seconds or 30 strokes, much easier to count strokes than seconds. So you get it into the canal up and down, up and down, 30 times with sodium hypochloride, uh, 30 times with EDTA. And then our general preference is to then let the canal soak with uh, chlorhexidine, 2% chlorhexidine, because chlorhexidine generally moves through the dentinal tubules very effectively. Remember in the apical third, uh, we've got this problem of the microbes moving deep into the dentinal tubules. So it's very, very simple. Get a starting point, get out the bulk of the old material with the shaper, do another 15 strokes with the shaper to allow space for the finisher, and then 60 strokes total with the finisher, 30 with sodium hypochloride, 30 with EDTA, and let it soak with chlorhexidine. So it's step one, step two, and step three. And I'm going to finish off um, with uh, just showing you that there's a, a, a quite a, 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 a increasing body of evidence that this is very, very beneficial and uh, very, very uh, 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 beneficial compared to our traditional round files, and particularly the finisher. 
there is no instrument that will be able to clean the apical third as well as the finisher. If you compare ultrasonics to the finisher, generally what a lot of uh, studies find, no major statistical difference unless you look specifically at the apical third. And the apical third, as I've said before, is the critical third for success. So at the apical third, the ultrasonic loses its effectiveness and the apical third is where the uh, finisher is most effective. So this has been very, very uh, uh, fast. Um, I just want to mention again that uh, you can contact uh, Brasler USA, you can contact me directly uh, through Next Level Endodontics if you want more information, if you want uh, training on these uh, instruments, and I'll be very happy to uh, provide that to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Trope. Um, we have some questions, uh, but before we get to those, I would like to, to again invite viewers to use the question box in your control panel to ask any questions that you have. Um, if you could just, re there's a review question here. The study by Gorni and Gagliani that you mentioned implied that the apical third of the canal is the most important for success in treatment. Do you agree? Yes, it's, uh, it's uh, um, interesting that even though we have microbes throughout the canal, uh, because the apical third is the deepest part of the canal, at, at that area we have uh, obligate anaerobic bacteria. That is also the area where we have most of the foramina, large foramina going through into the uh, periridicular tissue. So even though we've got microbes throughout the canal, uh, apical periodontitis is the rule and lateral periodontitis through an accessory canal is the exception. If we look at the accessory canals, we've got hundreds of accessory canals, particularly in, in multi-rooted teeth. But in 99% of the cases, the disease is at the apex. So those apical third microbes are maybe more pathogenic because they obligate anaerobe, or it just may be a, a, a function of the fact that that's where they are able to escape into the periapical tissues. So there's numerous studies that show it's in terms of biologic success, that's the presence or absence of a lesion, it's control of the apical microbes that is important. In terms of survivability functionality, it's the lack of taper or maintaining the original tooth structure that's important. So we have to clean the apical third from a microbiological point of view as best as we possibly can, while at the same time not over-instrumenting and over-tapering the coronal two-thirds. And that's where the old round files have fallen down, if you will, because they tend to come to a very narrow shape at the apical third, not cleaning very well, but they have great tapers. And so at the same time, they're not cleaning very well and they are weakening the tooth. These adaptive instruments are able to maintain a very narrow taper, but at the same time, clean that apical third. Okay, thank you. Uh, second question. In primary endodontics, the XP3D shaper is claimed to be better, to better maintain the anatomical shape of the canal. Is this true for retreatment also? Uh, yes, if the anatomical shape of the canal is still there to be maintained. <laughs> I hope that makes sense. Uh, the XP shaper will cut to number 30 if necessary. That means the if the canal is narrower than the 30 in any dimension, it'll make a 30. But generally, it will adapt through its flexibility and expandability by moving to the uh, path of least resistance. So that uh, automatically keeps the anatomical shape because you know, some parts of the canal are wider than others. In a retreatment, the treatment is already done. So in many of these cases, the, the anatomic shape is already destroyed by these round files. So in a retreatment, the shaper is more to remove the old uh, uh, filling, like a corkscrew, and then the extra 15 strokes is to do the best anatomical cleaning that is left, if you will, 
but the finisher is what is the key because the finisher can then go into not only the artificially created canal but also the original canal because of its tremendous expandability and it will clean both the artificial canal and the previously anatomic uh, uh, spaces. We have another retreatment question. How does the XP3D finisher compare with ultrasonics in cleaning canal debris in retreatment cases? Yeah, I mentioned that at the, at the end, and uh, this is very important because the ultrasonic is what is used uh, traditionally and has been used uh, for the last you know, 10 or 15 years. And the ultrasonic is very effective when it can vibrate ultrasonically. And that requires at least a 25 or a 30, and it needs to be free. So in the coronal two thirds, it's very, very effective and probably more effective than the finisher uh, or equally as, as effective. Where the ultrasonic uh, starts to lose effectiveness is in this critical apical third. In the apical third, as, I, as we've said, is the critical part for success, the canal starts to narrow. So the ultrasonic starts to hit against the walls and loses its ultrasonic energy and effectiveness. And the other problem is when you have a curvature, it will always tend to go to the outer curvature because the ultrasonic is straight and it wants to get back to the straight uh, uh, shape. With the finisher, uh, the, the fact that the tip can move in and out, in and out once the uh, bulb is collapsed. And of course, as you go around the curvature, the bulb will be collapsed. So the finisher is gonna be equally effective on the outer curvature and the inner curvature. So if you look at these studies on the finisher, uh, sometimes you look at the study and in the, the abstract it says the finisher and the ultrasonics were equally as effective statistically, but then you go a little bit deeper into the paper and in almost every one of these papers in the apical third, which is the critical part, the finisher is superior to the ultrasonic. Um, and last, um, do you want to review some more advantages of the 3D XP system compared to traditional files in retreatment? Yeah, so um, basically the advantage is the 3D file in itself makes an artificial shape in the canal. You have to get a, a, a good picture of what a canal looks like. A canal is oval, and in many cases, the major diameter is more than double the minor diameter, right? So you're looking at something that is nowhere any shape or form round. These large round diameters will make an artificial shape into this uh, non-round canal. So you've got two bad choices. Either you go for the minimum diameter and not clean very well in the maximum diameter, or you go for the maximum diameter and remove dentin that uh, will jeopardize the, uh, the uh, survivability of the tooth. In retreatment, you've got an additional problem. You are going to take up by, with, this, with these traditional round files, they take up the main uh, space and push everything into the irregularities. So even if uh, this was not done in the primary endo, after the retreatment, you're going to have a lot of extra debris, extra sealer, extra gutta percha into the, you know, the, the widest part of the canal, which then will uh, limit the effectiveness of the irrigant and whatever else you're going to do. The shaper is in effect hollow. Because of its thin diameter and its flexibility, there's a lot of space for both the file and the old filling. So the shaper basically wraps itself around the old filling and pulls it out without pushing it into the irregularities. So number one, it's very, very effective, particularly if you use it at the correct speed. It's very effective to remove the old filling uh, uh, in, in seconds, okay? And then it does that without pushing debris into the non-round areas so that when you get to the finisher, the finisher is extremely flexible, as I said, it's got a capacity of almost six millimeters. So that finisher can then 
move into these large diameters much more effectively, remove whatever uh, got a purchase sealer is in there, and then do an effective job in uh, removing biofilm, bacteria, et cetera, which will then be irrigated out uh, you know, with your irrigating technique. Okay, well, well, that's all the time we have for the questions today. Thank you everyone for your questions, but we've run out of time. So if we did not get to your question, we'll answer it after the webinar via email. Uh, be sure to take the free CE quiz associated with this webinar. Shortly, we will send you a recording of this presentation and instructions on how to access the CE quiz. Thank you all again for attending and a special thank you to Dr. Trope for your amazing presentation and for our sponsor for this webinar, Brassler USA. Thank you and have a good evening.